Right, everybody, welcome to another My Art Breaker panel event. Um, today we're focusing on the American pop market, um, the market, the works impacting the market, the highly investable category that we all know it to be. Um, we'll be looking at how we approach buying and how we approach selling, what to do and what not to do, most importantly. Um, we're joined by an amazing panel. We've got Louis Denizet and Rebecca Marsham from My Art Broker, our American pop specialists, and our special guest, very special guest, <laughs> Richard Polsky, um, who is our art authenticator specialist, um, who, if you are involved in this market, he'll probably be a household name, um, having worked extensively in the market and also have written a, a number of books and oft, often contributes to the press in this space. Um, so yeah, really exciting today. If, um, if you haven't joined us before, um, this, if you want to ask questions throughout the panel, there is a little box down the bottom. Um, we've got some questions from before, which I'd like to bring um, into the discussion. But any questions you want to ask, if you just tighten this little box down here, then I will start seeing those questions and I'll navigate them as we move through. So team, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Um, so let's start um, as we mean to go on and define the marketplace in its context. So but today we'll be talking about the American pop market overall, but with a focus on the print market, which is where my art broker speci specialise. Um, Rebecca, what, what sets American pop apart from other art movements in terms of market appeal? Um, well, I think that the first point to note is the proven resilience of this established arena. Uh, buyers recognize the importance and the excitement of buying into and actually being part of such a dynamic era in art history. And uh, we also see that with many of the Warhol portraits that he was so well known for, the painting is actually more famous now than many of his muses, which is quite extraordinary. And uh, the, the last point that I'd really like to make is that I feel very, very strongly, and I think we all see it, that, that these works by these giants in the American pop market are still so relevant today in modern culture. Um, so, you know, these, these artists that we're gonna discuss today really marked an epoch in art history. Richard, do you agree with that? Is that how you would define the difference between American pop from other categories? Pop was more, I don't, at the risk of sounding corny, it was a state of mind. It was more, you know, people talk about the term zeitgeist, what's in the air, and there was just something in the air. The person generally credited for putting the whole pop movement together was a dealer named Ivan Karp, who became the director of the Leo Castelli Gallery. And Karp, who I knew personally, would tell stories about how there was something in the air within two weeks, I mean, this is hard to believe, and maybe he's making this up, I don't know, I wasn't there. I was probably seven years old then when it started. Um, he met James Rosenquist, Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein, and I believe uh, the minimalist, possibly Dan Flavin. I mean, within two weeks, I mean, this is crazy, that much talent. And he said to his wife, uh, there's something that's happening, there's something going on. I keep running yeah. into these amazing artists and their their interest um, overlap. There's there's something about it felt like a movement. Mm. And movements are something that art historians come up with in order to tell a story. But this was legit. I've never seen anything since then. Anything really? like this. So, so you wouldn't so you don't think there's been something in the air in the same way? What about the YBAs just to be Devil's the YBA, okay, everybody loves the YBAs. It's a lot of fun and it's a great title and the people involved, you know, were just characters. Um, that's a little more manipulated. It just seemed like, you know, it was already in an era where information was so readily available and communications were so good. I mean, the 60s, I mean, you had to hop on a telephone. I mean, nobody remembers there were telephones, there were dials, you know, you die, you know, they're like antiques now. Yeah, the YBA thing was a lot of fun, wonderful, great for the market, great for art history. But no, I don't I think it was more good marketing, 
very good marketing. Mm, that's a good controversial subject. Um, yeah. Huey, what, what defines American pop for you? Um, well, I, I completely agree with everything that Rebecca and Richard have stated. I would add that um, I think that what characterizes pop art is the accessibility and the familiarity. I mean, pop art draws inspiration from pop culture, consumerism, mass media imagery. Um, so subject matters that are very easily recognizable and relatable to a very wide audience, including those that aren't traditionally interested in fine art. And I think that on top of that, there is a deeper um, social and cultural commentary beneath all of that um, very vibrant surface. Um, pop art often critiques celebrity culture, consumerism, mass media. So it adds a layer of intellectual appeal. And I think that the last thing that I would mention is that it's got such an amazing cross-generational appeal. I mean, the themes and the imagery uh, transcend generational boundaries. It appeals both to maybe an older audience um, who experienced the rise of consumer culture in the mid 20th century, but also to younger audiences um, who grew up in a world saturated by mass media and commercialism. So there's something for everyone. And so actually, can I can I just also uh, another point on that, that listening to Louis made me think of it, that uh, Warhol has been described as the Notre Dame of his time in that there are so many subjects that he uh, incorporated into his narrative that are relevant today and immediately, and I know that you all know that I love the Ladies and Gentlemen series, that's a really important one because, you know, gender fluidity and uh, status is such an important topic in 2023, 2024. So um, I think that's really interesting too. It's really almost like he birthed the beginning of the of the sort of you know we talk about pr and we talk about marketing richard i mean you know really has did anyone else ever invent that level of art pr that the pop artists really began but you know by playing on commercialism they themselves have now become you know as rebecca rightly said um there are many icons who people know the image of warhol's depiction of them better than they know the celebrity's face I mean, what, you know, that's marketing, isn't it? I like it. <laughs> Very um, cool. So yeah. let's, so let's get into market and dynamics um, and valuations. Um, Louis, from an acquisitions perspective, how do you approach evaluation in the pop art market? I suppose some of this will be the ways that we approach valuations anyway, but perhaps take us through that and look at, you know, how the historical influence of American pop impacts that value. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, so personally, the way that I operate is that when a collector brings a piece to me, the first thing that I ask is, of course, to be sent some images, some provenance information, some paperwork, and then I take the time to assess the condition of the artwork. Um, I take some time to think about whose hands it's been passed down to, and then, um, of course, with prints and multiples, it is a comparables market. So I have a look and I um, compile some data just to have a look and to see what other pieces have sold for on the market recently. Um, all of this information is very widely accessible via price databases. If you go on our website, so on myartbroker.com, we have listed every single print um, ever produced by the artists that we sell. And so if you type the name of an artwork in the search bar, you'll be able to find um, a listing where we share things such as the cataloging information, um, recent auction results. We've broken all of that down to very clearly delineate what the hammer price was, what the net return to the seller was, what a buyer would have paid, including buyer's premium. Um, we also include something called a value indicator. So that is an algorithm generated indication of um, what we believe the artwork can be found for on the market across all channels. So we feed that algorithm with data that we have ex access to, and then that will give collectors an idea of what they should look to spend on a piece uh, like that in good condition um, with some provenance etc now of course i do want to flag just to um hark back to your initial question that every valuation is 
custom. So there's no way of just uh, going online and finding one comparable and then determining the true value of your piece. There's so many different factors that need to be brought into um, that formula. And that's why it's really important to talk to experts and specialists um, because you might have a good surprise or um, of course the price point that you'll find online might not reflect the the same value as your piece. Mm -hmm. So I hope that that answers your question. So, so Louis, let's let's take people through what affects that value outside of outside of the kind of comps data. We've you mentioned there you were talking about condition, yes, authenticity, which we'll move on to in a sec as a whole subject. Um, <laughs> um, provenance, um, demand, supply, liquidity. Mm -hmm. What? Are, how do we? Let's say I come to you with a ladies and gentlemen print. Mm -hmm. What are you going to be looking for to ascertain where it fits within that value indicator that's based you know mainly on um on past sales results and private sale indicators yeah great question so the first thing that i'll look at is obviously i want to determine what type of print it is exactly so is it from the regular edition of 250 or was it an artist proof um, is it a trial proof? Is it a printer's proof, et cetera? Um, pieces that are outside of the regular edition totals. So for example, trial proofs, um, which is when Andy Warhol would have experimented with the colorways are generally unique. So naturally um, that scarcity drives desirability up and it drives value up as well. So if you're lucky enough to own a trial proof, um, you, you might have something um, a little bit more valuable than something from uh, the regular edition total. Um, in addition to that, I will obviously be looking at the condition of the print. So that's unbelievably important in the sense that your print, unfortunately, is not entirely unique. Um, once again, if you own a ladies and gentlemen, um, there, there might be 249 others out there and collectors will obviously want to get their hands on the one that is in the best condition possible. So it's incredibly important to make sure that your pieces are framed behind UV protected glass. Um, all of the pieces that we ever take into consignment are fully condition reported by conservation specialists. So we know exactly what the condition of the piece is um, at the time of the sale. And um, I mean, you mentioned authenticity. Authenticity is a no brainer that is, uh, you know, that is paramount. Um, and of course, that is something that we can check through paperwork. Um, some pieces will have a certificate of authenticity. If a print doesn't have a certificate of authenticity, that doesn't necessarily mean that it isn't authentic or that it can't be authenticated. Um, but it is important to turn to the right sources in order to have it authenticated. Um, I have seen many uh, certificates of authenticity printed out on people's computers um be wary of those and just make sure that the sources are accurate mm -hmm. richard naturally over to you <laughs> you've oh. seen many many pieces of paper with um authenticity written onto it well yeah that's always a fun subject to talk about um there's sort of a saying in our in my business uh more is less okay mm. by that i mean i see I mean, don't get me started. I see certificates that are, they're comical, where people will get gold embossed seals. They'll, I don't know where they get these things. I don't know if they steal them or manufacture them themselves, but they'll come from the Royal Highness and her personal, you know, the, they, they belong to a country. And this, I'm not gonna give away any countries, but this happens in the Middle East a lot, where you see these crazy certificates and people think by including as much information in a sheet of paper as possible, it looks official. This is a good thing. And it doesn't work like that. It's, it's entertaining. I mean, it's not funny, but I can't help but laugh at these things. It's like, where did you get this? How'd you come up with this? And, you know, the storytelling, you know, my, the relatives, the, the families who own these things, and the name dropping, and it, 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 it's a comedy of errors. Basically, when it comes to authenticity, uh, are we talking about Andy Warhol or are we talking in general? Just go for it, Richard. Tell Just us. 
his favorite. I don't know where, where, where to go with it. But Are there um, specifics around, I mean, I, I we certainly see a lot more fakes in the Warhol market than course, anyone else. Of course you it's, do. But yeah, I, I mean, I work with Louis and Rebecca and, and other people. In other words, we've worked out something that I think is very effective where Louis is offered a print by a client and most things are good, but you sure don't want to get one that's bad. And Louis will run it by me and we do a quick check, you know, let's, let's confirm everything. And occasionally Louis will get me an image. It, it, let's say it'll be a Mick Jagger, a Warhol Mick Jagger. Well, as most people know, what was so unique about those prints was that they were signed by Andy and they were signed by Mick was very i mean uh, when they first came out my guess is they were selling better among rock memorabilia collectors than warhol collectors i mean these things were fantastic and they look better as time goes on in my opinion i think they're great but anyway so louis will send me the image and i'll double check both signatures we'll check the dimensions of it. we'll check the colors we'll check um again provenance where did this thing come from i mean everything comes from somewhere may not be, you know, what you want to hear. I mean, did it come from an established Warhol print dealer? If not, you know, the story better be good. And so we're looking at every history of ownership, provenance, dimensions, edition number, signatures. In this case, two signatures, not one, two. And you come to the conclusion, okay, we're good to go here. Then it's offered. We don't offer it until, you know, it's... It, it's a, a, a checks and balance, if you will. And mm -hmm. this, but I mean, people always ask me the same question. You know, how do you know something's authentic? How do you know it's safe to buy it? And it's always the same answer. Know who you're dealing with. Deal with, if you're dealing with a reliable company or gallery or auction house, if you're dealing with reliable people over the years have proven themselves to be professional, and that's the word, professional, then you do business with them. Then, you know, obviously there are all the other intangibles. Are you treated well? Are their prices good? Do they do everything they say they're going to do? And this is what separates, you know, the good companies from the ones that are just amateurs. And it's important because most of what you deal with in this business is amateur behavior. And you get into this because the art world's unregulated and it gets very comfortable. When I started authenticating art, I remember my wife said to me, she goes, well, how long is this going to last? Aren't you going to run out of... You know, things taught that everybody thinks are out there. And I said, you have no idea. It's endless. And as the mm -hmm. art becomes more valuable, the the number of bad actors out there start, you know, they, they grow exponentially. I mean, it just never ends. Um, already we're seeing, I'll, I'll keep this brief, but already because there are all these great Basquiat paintings coming up on the market in the next month or so, I, I, I've had an influx of Basquiat business. You just see how these events trigger things. Mm -hmm. um, there was a Warhol series on Netflix that seemed to bring in business. So a lot of a lot of this uh, business, been, both from a collector's viewpoint and from a dealer's viewpoint, it's event driven, in my opinion. What's in the air? There you go. I mean, the you know, with the influx of. Um of a height, heightened interest, whether it be from, you know, the latest Netflix or whether it be from an extraordinary auction result like we saw with um, Shade so Shot Sage Marilyn, there's okay. going to be more and more forgeries, aren't there? We've, we've delved quite deeply already into authentication, but I do want to go back and look at some particular stories because Richard's got some amazing stories around this um, around this area. But Richard, before we, before we leave kind of the dynamics of the, of the pop market, if you don't mind me saying, you've been in it rather a long time. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, mean, I started in this in 1978. In 1978. Yeah. So, in your extensive experience, how do you see the? How do you? How do you see? I remember once you saying to me, um, "The thing that fascinates you is how, when you started in art, you started mm -hmm. in the art world. Oh and yeah, yes. now in the art market. So, I'd love to understand when that transition." took place, wow. particularly in, in, in American pop. It stuck with me because I think that a lot of us who, you know, are knocking on 40, 50, we, you know, I remember an art market where the American pop market has been 
always established, strong, resilient. But you remember a time before it was a investable category in that way. That's all very true. And these are happy memories for me. Because when I got started, pop was my favorite thing. I, I was a huge Warhol fan. But everyone's goal in life was to own a Jasper Johns. Oh my God, if you can own a Johns, even his worst print, his most minor nothing print, you were a player. Mm -hmm. And the prints became very important when I had my first job in the art world. I worked for a gallery that was a print gallery. And their whole explanation to collectors was the prints that were done, you know, at least the earlier ones, you know, from the 60s and 70s, had as much integrity as the paintings and drawings. The artists put the work in. They worked with these major print shops like, oh, Gemini was a big one. Uh, Tanya, what was her name? Tanya Grossman. Uh, I cannot remember the name of her print publishing shop, but she was John's and Rauschenberg's printers. And these things were great. And you didn't feel like, oh, I can't afford a painting. I'm stuck with a print. You were happy. You were like, God, I own a John's Target print. This is, you know, how cool is that? But you're right. It was back then about the art world, not the art market. People got involved in this, or at least I got involved in it, because you just liked the art and you thought it was super cool. And the best experience you could have was meeting the artists. Back in the day, in the 70s and even the early 80s, you'd go to New York City and if you behaved yourself, you, you know, you yeah, conducted yourself like a gentleman, you were respectful, you did your homework, you knew the work, you could approach virtually any famous artist and they would have a conversation with you. I mean, you, you might not get invited to the studio. That was pushing it. You know, perhaps if you're an attractive woman, might have worked out for you. But I'm a man, and, you know, it was an all-male-dominated art world back then. But that, that's another story. Uh, be that as it may, in the mid-'80s, everything shifted. That's when it became the art market, in my opinion, where the auction houses took over. There was heavy Japanese buying, a lot of competition for the best artists. And I personally got very involved in the Ed Ruscha market, of all things, because I knew Ed a little. I was living in L.A. at the time. I wasn't tight with him, but I had lunch with him once and locked the keys of, in my car with the engine running and made <laughs> a complete fool out of myself to him. But I think he saw me as human, hopefully, when that happened. And, you know, we did end up getting our lunch. But be that as it may, as a dealer, you were always trying to identify those artists who you thought really that hadn't gotten enough attention. But, you know, Ruscha, I think, got his first major show at the Modern in New York, probably, I'm guessing, the late 80s, around then. But he had been overlooked for years. And this stuff was great. I mean, there, this was original stuff. And you always would ask yourself, what would I buy? Even though I'm a dealer and I'm involved in commerce, I like the stuff. And I would always say, God, what, what do I want for myself? And these were things I was buying. I was buying Warhol. In Warhol's case, the big moment was buying a painting of Chairman Mao. And the prints, of course, are terrific. The Maos were, I think they were 12 by 10 inches. They were called Baby Maos. And sure enough, my good buddy Ivan Karp came through for me. And the irony to the story is that when Warhol died, which would have been February of 87, no one knew what was going to happen. Uh, were they going to go up in value, go down in value? Somehow, I think I paid $4,500 for this. This is for a painting, not a print, a little 12-inch mouth. And within a year, I remember selling it for $20,000 and thinking, God, I'm a genius. Look at this. What a great businessman. Don't ask what it's worth now. <laughs> okay. I mean, but, yeah, people can read your books if they want to hear about that, right? <laughs> well, they're funny stories. But I guess the reason I tell them is it, it almost seems quaint. But I sort of, I mean, it's not nostalgia, but it's more, if there's some way the art world were to change, the best thing that could happen to it was that you have people getting involved just because they want to live with the stuff. It's super cool. And we live in an era where people warehouse things. They buy these multi-million dollar paintings, their investments, they don't even live with them. And it's like, you got to be kidding. I mean, you got to be kidding. But anyway, I don't want to get too far afield here. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the, nature, that's the nature of an investable market, isn't it? And, you know, we yes, we too see that, but it is quite rare. Um, and I think, um, yeah, it's very interesting how you talk about 
this happening in the 80s, this transition. And, and, and again, it's interesting now because I think we'll look back at this period with Warhol being dead for 35 years or something similar. Um, and you know, and there's a there's a change again now, isn't there? That the market dynamic is changing, and over the even the past sort of five seven years, we've seen the demand come up, and and it's almost like he's become a master now in people's minds. But you know, something about someone being dead for a certain amount of time, which which you know sadly appreciates their work to a certain degree. Um, Rebecca, I want to focus a little bit more on Warhol specifically now before we move on to other American pop artists. Um, how in your experience, has the market evolved in recent years? Um, <clears throat> good question. Um, I think that over the last seven years, we saw that in 2022, it was the biggest year for Warhol print sales, uh, with sales to the value of or to the tune of 52 million pounds sterling, which was a surge of 143% uh, from the year before. And um, interestingly, although 2023 didn't see uh, well, actually saw lower sales, we saw more lots going through auction. Um, so, you know, as a result of that, I think it's fair to say that uh, Warhol is, uh, the, the interest is unwavering and he still absolutely controls market share in the auction houses. And I suppose, you know, with more investors, if we talked about coming into this market and sort of define the investor versus the collector a little unfairly because you know really we often talk about this we talk about how you know it's just like buying a house you buy something that you you want to make part of your life i always make that parallel you want to have it as as part of your life your home but you know you're not going to buy the house that everyone's telling you is going to depreciate in value because they're about to build a you know a car park next door to it so it's a very similar thing um we had a couple of questions around this particular point um before the panel given warhol's prolific output how do you distinguish it's a great question between the pieces that represent a good investment versus those that are of more common interest great question um yeah it is a good question uh so um, I think that, again, in 2023, we saw a lot of interest and a lot of investment people buying the trial proofs. Uh, Louis talked a little bit earlier about what that means to, to have a trial proof. And of course, because of the nature of the trial proofs, um, you just can you just take people through, you know, there'll be people here that understand what a trial proof is, but we've touched on it a couple of times. Just just let's explain what a trial proof is. As sure. As a regular edition. Yeah, so a, a, a trial proof, these were created as a test colorway. So, um, and I like to imagine that they had a lot of fun creating these, but what it means is that everyone is rendered unique. So when they come to market, when we hear that a trial proof is coming to market, it causes incredible excitement because we're not quite sure what it's going to look like. Um, so that's that's the trial proof. So it's, it's one of one. Um, so, uh, with the trial proofs in 2023, 2023 was a really great year for the trial proofs, and uh, we saw a surge of 207% increase uh, from the year before uh, for demand for those. So, whenever we have a trial proof, there's a lot of interest that's generated, a lot of excitement. Um, also, the the sets, you know, as, as, as the, the the series, you know, for example, the Marilyns. Uh, with, with those, the further we get away from the date of creation, the harder they are. Going, it's going to be to find a, a set with matching numbers. We we do see sets with mismatching numbers that people have created themselves, but for matching numbers, they just become rarer and rarer and people really want those works. Um, I think harping back to the trial proofs, because they are exciting, just to give an example, the Apple trial proof from the ad series, uh, is it, it's a super example. It's got an estimated value between 250 and 350,000 pounds sterling. And it's shown a consistent growth on average annual growth rate of the last five years of 28 percent so um it's a it's a very highly sought after piece they're difficult to place these big sets aren't they <laughs> you know that's one of the issues with them you've got to hang them together to get the full full effect i always think that's you know it's 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 a problem for in many cases You've got to have a big room with big walls for sure which, but, is why, which is why sometimes they do end up very sadly in storage people yeah. are like i buy it i love it i know it's a great investment and when i buy that property with that wall i'll display all 12 of them together yeah. 
but also I think what's what's sad is that I, you know the, the the pool of investors into sets is smaller than those wanting to buy individual pieces. So over the years we've seen plenty getting broken up and being sold individually, which is understandable but sad mm. because mm -hmm. they are so incredible to see them together. It's it's rather wonderful how many people we see looking to put them back together again, isn't it? Yes, yeah. indeed. And it becomes a a project. Oh, these project. Are, yeah, yeah. They're not immediately available. We, you know, we all sort of know um, around the team at my art broker. You know, when something comes in, we go, oh, we know exactly who's trying looking to build, looking to build that set. And of course, you know, building a set whilst they might not be matching numbers, building that set once you've bought once you've bought one and two, is actually you know looking to create more of an investment because at some point you might be able to bring the set back to the market. So that's quite an exciting exciting project so um another question from beforehand are there specific series or periods within warhol's oeuvre that attract more attention in today's market i know you've touched on this before yeah i would say that uh the obvious ones are the mick jaggers that were created in 1975 the marilyn's always they were created in 1967 so they're even older than me um, the Queen Elizabeth, the flowers, the Campbell soups. But uh, in fact, in our last podcast, we touched on this. Uh, we are seeing increased demand for the slightly lesser known ones, the ladies and gentlemen, the Kikus, the triptych. Um, and and of course, you know, the Cowboys and Indians. The last few months has been massive demand for those. And touching on your point of people trying to collect or curate their own collection of that series, um, I, I have a, a number of, of clients who are doing exactly that. They're slowly building into their Cowboys and Indians collection. It's really, really important ones. So I would say those ones. There's something about um, collecting one piece from a series. I don't know, I'm sure you can all give examples where um, you become a little bit obsessed, don't you, by that particular series? I mean, particularly something quite diverse, like the ad series, where you can, you know, it, it's not just another sort of example of the same. Um, which is, I think, is is Warhol's magic appeal. He really yes. gets you gets you hooked. Um, final question on Warhol that we had prior to the panel. Warhol's work spans a variety of mediums. So yes, we're talking, you know, about a, an artist that isn't primarily a printmaker in some of the ways that we might describe other artists that we specialize in. Um, how does the medium of a Warhol piece influence its market value and collector interest? Well, as we know, Andy Warhol was an incredibly prolific artist and he also explored a, a variety of different mediums including uh, painting, film, um, silk screens, uh, I mean you even find on the market signed invitations to the Leo Castelli exhibition or whatever it might be and these all have their own value uh, but I, I like to think that Andy Warhol really took silk screening which was which is a beautiful art form to a, a, a dizzy height. It's it's now really recognized for its beauty and its you know clean lines. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful art form. And the, the thing that I see with the print market, these silk screens, is that you can make a it's a great investment choice because you can make an educated and informed decision on whether you're going to invest or not, because as opposed to an original painting where it's the one piece so you might it might have come to auction maybe once before or twice before with the prints you can you, there's comparable auction data so you can make that informed decision i think it's a really fabulous place to to be investing your money mm -hmm. um brilliant i'm going to move almost artist by artist if i may because we've got a few questions from before the panel um basquiat louis Let's talk about Basquiat. Um, question from before, quite an interesting one, and I think this would be, be great for Richard to play in on this as well. Um, Basquiat has a unique position as both a street artist and a revered figure in the art world. How is his market responding to the current trends in art collection? But I'd probably also throw in there the current trend for almost every piece of merchandise from Primark to high end, reproducing his imagery. How does that affect the collecting market? You're on mute, Louis. 
silly me. Um, no, that's a great question. Um, well, I think that the first thing that I would like to say in regards to, um, to Jean-Michel Basquiat is that right now what we're noticing is that there's a really huge appetite for iconic art and artists. And that's in part due to the fact that their imagery is proliferated absolutely everywhere. Um, I, like you said before, Uniqlo t-shirts and mugs and posters. And I'm sorry, I should mention it's Keith Haring as well. Keith Haring and Basquiat seem to be absolutely all over everything at the moment, don't they? Absolutely everywhere, of course, 100%. Um, I couldn't agree more. And that contributes to allowing um, those um, signs and symbols um, to permeate our collective conscience. And we're thinking about it all the time. And so we, we want to brand ourselves with Herring and Basquiat. Now, of course, when it comes to actually making an acquisition, that's when we have to make an informed decision. What do we want to acquire? Would you like to acquire, you know, a, a t-shirt that presumably will not um, increase in value in the future? Or would you like to acquire an original artwork authorized by the artist or their estate, which is likely to appreciate in value in the future, which in a way is an investment, something you can both enjoy and then pass down and um, reap the benefits of having invested in. So just to take a little bit of a step back and to hark back to the first part of your question um, about Basquiat's unique position as a street artist, um, and a revered figure in the art world. I think that once again, what we're noticing is there's a huge appetite for iconic art and artists. That's certainly the case for Basquiat. Um, his art holds both historical significance and cultural relevance, I would say. Um, there's also a huge focus on diversity. Um, I think it's really important to mention that Basquiat's heritage is Haitian and Puerto Rican. Um, he's a Black artist first and foremost, and his art explores themes related to race, identity, social justice, and so many collectors um, want to help um, underrepresented voices um, in the art world, and, and that's one of the many ways in which they can contribute to that. Um, of course, Basquiat has a very interesting position that is at the convergence of pop art and street art. I mean, Basquiat's background um, is, of course, street art. Uh, Basquiat's early artistic roots are deeply intertwined um, with the street art and the graffiti culture of New York City um, from the late 70s uh, and the early 80s. You know, he, he gained prominence as a graffiti artist under the pseudonym uh, Samo, S-A-M-O, um, and his raw and very expressive style, uh, his very gestural brushwork really does uh, resonate with street art. But at the same time, he often frequently incorporated imagery um, from pop culture and mass media and consumerism. There are so many very recognizable symbols and logos and icons from everyday life, like the crown or the skulls or celebrity names, um, lots of graphic elements. Um, and so all of that allowed for this uh, melange of pop art and street art to offer something really fresh and new and different. And pop art and street art really are the two leading art genres on the market, um, which I think com completely explains um, why Basquiat is so incredibly popular today. Um, and of course, the investment value. Um, let us not forget acquiring a Basquiat is uh, is something that is very likely to uh, appreciate in value in the future. The, the original pieces are limited in supply due to the artist's premature death um, in 1988, I believe. I believe. Um, yes, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Um, but thankfully today, um, a number of posthumous prints are being released by the estate of Jean-Michel Basquiat. Um, and what we're noticing, and I, I can talk about this a little bit more later, but what we're noticing is that there's such an appetite, there's such huge demand and very limited supply. And that's why I'm so incredibly thankful that Jean-Michel Basquiat's estate is, is allowing us um, to get our hands on fresh new pieces that are still being released uh, periodically. So yeah. Brilliant. Richard, how do you feel about... Um seeing these images 
everywhere. How do you think the artists would feel about seeing these images everywhere? I think well, they'd love it. <laughs> I, it's, it's, it's so complicated, the legacy of these guys. Um, as everyone knows, there was a major Basquiat show last year. It was called King Pleasure, and it was organized by the Basquiat sisters. On the plus side, uh, the catalog is terrific, and I recommend everyone pick up a copy of it. It's one of the five best Basquiat catalogs out there. If you really want to get a sense of who he was, not just his work, but who he was as a person, this is a good book. Um, the other positive aspect of the show and the catalog this has allowed certain works to come onto the, well, to come onto view that no one had ever seen before. There were a lot of drawings, a few paintings, things I certainly hadn't seen. And that made me happy. It was nice to go, wow, there's even you know, more treasures out there, more undiscovered things. On the negative side, the marketing of products is, it's out of control. I mean, I, I'm on, I guess, this mailing list where I'd say twice a day in my inbox, there's something from the King Pleasure people. I don't know what's going on with these guys, but every day there's like a new product. I mean, there's a, a Basquiat basketball. I mean, what, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> you got a basketball with Basquiat. I mean, I, I mean, we could list not tens, but dozens, and maybe there are probably even a few hundred products you can buy. And this whole thing got started with Keith Haring's Pop Shop, which I actually got to back in the 80s when it was in Soho in New York. And you'd go in there, and to Keith's credit, you know, his whole big statement was artists for everyone. And he meant it. He actually backed it up to his credit. You could buy a little crawling baby pin for 50 cents, I think. You could buy a swap. I think most people know what swatches are. I think Keith designed four different swatches. I don't remember how much they cost at the time. I guess it's maybe $75 or so. You could buy posters. You could buy a cool T-shirt. I mean, it was fun. It was done with integrity. Yeah, they wanted to make money, but it wasn't done for that reason. Keith was mentored a bit by Andy Warhol, and he's taking Warhol's Art is Good Business a step further with his pop shop. And from what I've read, Andy was a big fan of it. He thought it was great. He thought it was fantastic that Keith was doing this. The Basquiat merchandising is, it's sort of crossing over to being a tacky. And, you know, you wonder, everyone loves saying things like, oh, if Andy Warhol were alive to see this, he'd be so happy. His, worth is, his work is worth so much money. I mean, Warhol, I mean, again, not to go off on too big of a tangent, but he actually cared how much his work sold for compared to his contemporaries and his friendly rivals like Johns and Rauschenberg. He would send one of his people, one of his employees, to a Sotheby's or Christie's auction, and they, you know, when his work was, had come up like an Elvis painting, and he'd have the person report back, hey, the Elvis did well, it brought 85000 and Andy would be like, yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, but a Johns brought 120000 and Jan, Andy would be like, oh, my God, someday, someday they'll get it, and he was right. But the to point to all this is the merchant, you have to be able to separate the merchandise from the art, okay? You just have to. It's, it, it, it's fun. I mean, I like, like, I like hats, you know, and there are all these Basquiat hats now with crowns on them and skulls and all that. It's fun. I, I like the fun aspect of it. And I, it's always good for the art world when an artist penetrates popular culture and becomes larger than life. I mean, there are only a handful of myths, what I call myths in the art world, at least in American art. And they include Jackson Pollock, Georgia O'Keeffe, Andy Warhol, and now Basquiat sort of entered that pantheon. Um, I mean, you know, obviously there's Picasso and, you know, Frida Kahlo. I think. But they're really very few. And the, the point of commonality to all this is the story. People are as interested now in Basquiat's life as they are in his art, maybe even more so. And this is what happens. This is when an artist becomes really significant. When the, it's not the world who's interested, it's everyone. Anyone who's interested in popular culture, anyone who reads, goes to the movies, they, they know who Basquiat is. It's crazy. I mean, who would have thought this 20 years ago? Nobody would have believed this. 
So yes, the merchandise does some good, but you know, people always worry, will it dilute the achievement of the artist? Does it dilute the value of the prints or the paintings? No, it makes no difference ultimately at the end of the day. But so, you do uh, wonder about all this. I, I, I'll, do you know what? I'll just, because um, I, I, this is a subject that I'm absolutely fascinated by. And um, I will actually just play devil's advocate. I think it will affect, I think, it do, I think it's part of the history of these artists. And in 50 years time, the market and the reception of these artists will be very different because of the way they've been reinvented for the masses. Um, you see it an awful lot with artists, artworks particularly that were made during the 18th century, 19th century, where an image has become so incredibly iconic that it's almost a poster child for that for that century or that era um and we're very um we're very occupied with what we see as the new at the moment being trash it's what we do we say new stuff is trash basically we love stuff to have a level of not a level of um establishment but actually it's just the, it's the continuation of that story you know the fact that there was once a pop shop and now every high street store has picked up imagery i mean it's 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 the legend that kind of lives post the artist which you know one could argue is what the definition of legend and iconic is really so i think it's quite exciting but let's talk about these artists in relation to each other we've talked about the relationships between them um basquiat that relationship and the collaborations um Louis, is there something significant coming up at auction in May at Sotheby's? You're on mute again. I'm sorry, Louis. <laughs> you know there is. Absolutely, yes. It's super exciting. Um, there is a beautiful collaborative piece um, by Basquiat and Warhol. It's an untitled painting. It's being offered by Sotheby's in May, and it is being valued at a whopping $18 million. I think it's worth pointing out that this piece was last uh, sold at auction at Sotheby's in 2010, and it sold for $2.8 million. So that is a beautiful appreciation and value. Um, what do we yeah. think it will make? What do we think it'll make? That is such a great question. Um, I'm an optimist. I think it's going to go above um, the high estimate. And I think there's just so much enthusiasm that's been generated um, by many different things lately in regards to Basquiat and Warhol. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, there was a beautiful retrospective at the uh, Louis Vuitton Foundation in Paris in the spring and summer of 2023. Um, it just, it just generated so much enthusiasm and a huge portion of the works that both artists collaborated on were exhibited um, in the same place for the first time. Um, I believe that they have both produced over 160 works together, um, mm -hmm. which is a lot more than people think. Um, and these pieces are actually very uh, uh, polished and detailed. Um, and they're really worth seeing in the flesh. And they're so rare to see and to find. I mean, think about all the times when you go to a museum and that you see in Andy Warhol or a Basquiat. We see them all the time. But how many times have you seen a piece where both artists collaborated on together? Frankly, I'm pretty sure that you can count that on the fingers of one hand. That's certainly my case. And this is and this this is four hands you're referring to, rather. Um, rather yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> The, um, Can I just check something? Yeah. Okay, keep it brief. Okay, back in, right after Warhol died, okay, you had his estate. You, if you were heck the right way, you could buy paintings directly from the estate. If you were a Gagosian or a big player, you really could get paintings. All right. I was a small player. Okay. But I knew Vincent Fremont, who was one of the people who ran Warhol's life. And he, it was a privilege. He let me go in and buy a few paintings. And along with our business, and then he pulled out, it was a little like eight by 10 inch cam canvas. It was a collaborative painting between Warhol and Basquiat. And I looked at it, I, I'm pretty sure Warhol had done a hamburger. He was doing these advertising pieces late in life. And I think Basquiat's painted like a snake on top of it or something. And I looked at this thing, it was kind of a peach color. It's a funny color. And I probably could have bought it for five, $6,000. And I was like, this is terrible. 
I mean, I, I don't want this. Why would I want this? You know, this is silly. I didn't say that. I didn't want to insult anyone. But I'm thinking to myself, why would I want this thing? And again, this is what happens happens this looks pretty good these i can't emphasize this enough to to your audience artists are the great artists the truly great artists are always a step ahead of their audience that's just who they are they they see things in ways we don't and if you stick with them if you stick with a good artist you you, you know we're talking about living artists now you go with it and it's not that everything an artist does is great I mean, even Picasso, probably 20% of what he did is really great. The rest is pretty good. But you stay with these people. These, If you believe in someone, you buy them across the board. You have work because chances are down the road, it's going to hold up. And it's always about what survives the test of time. And I made a mistake that day. I obviously should have bought that. It would have been so cool to have one of these collaborative paintings. I didn't see it. Anyway. I mean, we've we've all made those mistakes, Richard. Like, yeah. so... <laughs> I can write a book about this. <laughs> Even looking at data sometimes, you know, oh. you should write a good. Um, anyway, anyway, um, I've just realised that we are so close to the mark, and we've hardly we might have to do a part two of this, guys, because we haven't got through. I mean, it's very very difficult to cover the American pop market um, and the stories that we have um, in an hour. Um, I'm going to ask one author one authenticity question, um, and then I'm going to ask about predictions and what you would invest in now. So rather nicely bouncing off what Richard didn't buy, <laughs> what would you buy now? Um, which I think one of the few, few questions about authenticity, and nobody has been brave enough to write me a message in this little thing down here. So do so now. You've got you've got seven minutes if you've got a pressing question. Um, one of the big questions we have around um, authenticity um, is how you approach it when, so, you know, we've got, we've, we've talked about provenance, we've talked about the importance of um, paperwork, we've talked about condition, we've talked about um, the story, the, when there's too much of a good story that, you know, things start to look a little bit suspicious. Um, we've talked in the past on podcasts about um, you know, brilliant paperwork, but then a, a gallery from 1980s has got some sort of bad press and how we approach that and how we organize that. If I bring you something, Richard, without any provenance, without any paperwork, where do you go first? Is it a gut instinct after so many years? I mean, this is why we use you because you have such great gut instinct over the years. Um, yes, but yeah. But how, but is it yeah. just, is it gut instinct or is there a sort of process in place? Well, it's, it's always authenticity, I tell people, is based on two things. What does the object look like and what is its backstory? Of the two, what does it look like is the most important thing. Mm. And it's always about if someone brings me, like I authenticate the work of Jackson Pollock, which is the most complicated thing I have to do. Um, if somebody brings me a potential Pollock, I'm always, my first thoughts are, how does this compare to other genuine Pollocks that I've seen in my life? I've seen almost all of the major paintings, the ones I'm missing, never saw blue poles, in a, which is in Australia. And there's one at the Tehran Museum of Art. A, they have a great Pollock, but that's, that's that. you could do a podcast on how the Tehran Museum of Art ended up with one of Pollock's greatest paintings. It's a crazy story. Another time. But anyway, it's funny. It's a very funny story. Uh, but anyway, no, it's always sure there is a gut in. I mean, you know, people love saying to me when they hire me, they say, wait a minute, you're charging me $3,500 to authenticate a Warhol painting. Okay. And I, my guess is, you know, within five seconds of seeing it, whether it's real or not, I'm paying you $3,500 for five seconds. And I'm like, yeah, five seconds in 45 years. And this is how it works. You know, the, I once got interested in wine. I wanted to collect wine. I wanted to be a wine connoisseur. And the first piece of advice I was given is, you got to drink a lot. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, that might not be so bad. But, you know, with art, you got to look a lot. And the greatest thing I can tell people is, if you're interested in an artist, could be Warhol, Basquiat, Herring, be Damien Hirst, 
see as many of these things in person as possible. Read as many books. And don't, you know, people, you know, with most books, you're supposed to read them. With art books, look at the pictures. That's more important. It's always come down to experience. See as much as you can. Immerse yourself in that artist's work. This is how you become a connoisseur. This is how you put yourself in a position to determine authenticity. You got to put the work in. And it's fun. That's the best part of this. This is fun to do. Oh my God, what what could be better than you know going to the art fairs and you know going to a, an art fair in Paris? I mean, how much fun is that? This is not a hardship, you know, collecting art. It's great. So anyway, look a lot. Brilliant. Um, I am going to do. I'm going to suggest a part two um, for our community manager. I think we're going to need to because we haven't got through half what we wanted to. Let's leave on um, something I've discussed. With with all of you before, but that's just me knowing. What would you buy in the print market? I'm gonna make it, it has to be the print market. American pop, right now. Who do you want to start, Charlotte? You are Rebecca, you start. You've got an answer for me, I know. Um, if money was no object, are we making it money as no object? Do you know what I would do? I would build the entirety of the ladies and gentlemen. Mm. I've got such a good feeling about it. And yeah. I think they're great price points. And, and they're beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful. So that's where I'd go. Excellent. Um, if money was no object, I want a nude by Roy Lichtenstein. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why, Louis? Why do I want a nude by Lichtenstein? Because... Um, I don't know. I just I think that um, at the beginning of his career, Lichtenstein was really well known for um, you know his bendy dots and, and things like that. And the landscapes and the nudes were a little bit overlooked. They were just a little bit overshadowed. And today they're just gaining a lot of momentum. And um, when you look at his top print sales, um, a lot of them are his nudes, two nudes, nude reading, things like that. I think that they're absolutely beautiful. They're iconic of his style. They're going to appreciate and value in the future. So. Yeah, with an unlimited budget, that's what I would opt for. Richard? Oh, boy, that's a tough one. Uh, tempted, tempted to go with the Jasper Johns print, but I'm going to go with Ed Ruscha's Red and Blue Standard Station. Mm -hmm. For me, that's just classic pop, iconic. And the guy was able to take something it's pretty mundane, a gas station, and turn it into an object of beauty and mystery. So, yeah, Ed Ruscha's Red and Blue Standard Station. That's my choice. I do like your Jasper John choice too. Oh, John's is, John's is, um, in my opinion, uh, our greatest living print. He's just superior. They're I mean, very exciting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. What about, you. You, what about you, Charlotte? Oh, thanks for asking. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, good, Rebecca. Good, good idea. Good. I mean, I've always, you, whenever, I mean, I, from an investment potential, full set endangered species done yeah i reckon yeah. that one. um but from a um non-investment perspective but still a very good investment but you know if i'm i'm looking to double my money um i would have an after the party um i absolutely i know richard's like what a gog i absolutely love it as an image um oh, yeah. i think it's um i could look at it for a very long time it's a great story, isn't it? The after the party. I think there's, I think I'm always going to prefer the lesser known Warhols because it makes me feel like I own something that other people are perhaps, it's, first of all, it's not as obvious and no one likes being obvious. <laughs> um, and yeah, it makes you feel like you've got something special. I mean, the print market and many of these luxury asset markets are communities, right? So we're all interested in what other people have are, are investing in and what pe other people are caring about. But that's what makes it quite special in the print market to own something that's quite unique. Um, and if that's not going to be an AP or a TP or a PP, it's going to be something that, you know, which Richard would advise you against, which we would probably class it as a B work, a B work artwork by an A, by a star artist. Um, but yeah, there's something quite special about that. 
if investment is not your number one goal, um, which I don't think it ever should be really. Also, that it's, it's such an iconic um, depiction of Andy Warhol's life, wasn't it? The past. Well, exactly. We talked a little bit earlier about, you know, this obsession with um, the artist as the celebrity, which is, I, I just, I find that a fascinating topic, particularly in the American pop era where, you know, one could argue it sort of all began. Um, but it, that's, a, I think that's another podcast or another panel discussion for another day, isn't it? Um, but thank you all so much for being here. Fantastic chats. I just wish, I wish we have covered more, but we will do. Thanks so much, everyone. So much. Thanks to all. be continued. To be continued. Bye-bye, guys. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.